you in communion with one another. Lord, there are so many who cannot make it to church today because of the weather that is here. Lord, we join our hearts with them through the power of your Spirit. Lord, keep us safe today. Bring your guiding hand to all of those who are on the roads this morning. Assist your emergency workers, your snow plowers, your police, in caring for your creation and for your people in this day. Lord, help us to lift, lift a joyful noise to you this day. Bring your spirit in this place. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you to turn to number 3042 in your green hymnals. But a shout to the north.
because I'm praising God for the time with you this morning. So we're just going to push on through this service and raise it in our joy in our small numbers of mighty sound of praise to God. So I invite any of our liturgists this morning to lead us in the opening prayer. <coughs> Come, Come our light, and the our Come, Come our light, and the us from death. Come, Come our vision, and heal our wounds. Come, Come lay down our lives, and heal our wounds. Come, Come our us from the thorns of our sins. God is almighty, like we all know. God is almighty. 
and all powerful. But even so, he cares for each of us personally. Each and every one of us, God cares for us personally. No person or thing can be compared to God. We describe God as best as we can to our limited knowledge and language, but we only limit our understanding of Him and His power. We even compare Him to what we experience on earth. Don't limit his walk in your life by underestimating him. Even the strongest people get tired at times. But God never get tired. His power never to be diminished. He's never too tired. Is never too busy to listen to you. His strength is our strength. Even in our crushing time, in our sad time, in the time that we feel that nothing is happening for us, but we just have to remember that when we focus on God, He will renew. I read. Have ye not known? Have ye not heard? It's not been told to you from the beginning. Have ye not understood from the foundation of the earth? It is he who sit above cycles of the earth, and the inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings prince to nothing, and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted scarcely so scarcely as their stem taking root in the earth. When you blow upon them, they wither. And the tempest cries them off, carries them off like stubble. To whom will you compare me? Or whom is my equal? Say the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name. Because he is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have ye not known? <coughs> Have ye not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the end of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. And strength and strengthen the powerless. Even youth will faint and be weary, and the young will fall, will, will fall exhausted. 
for this, for those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up wings with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Prophet Isaiah is trying to make us is letting us know that we cannot rely on our strength alone. We have to give ourselves wholeheartedly to the Lord. That once we give ourselves to the Lord, the Lord will renew our strength. And make us see things from a different perspective from our normal human view or physical eye. Or He will make us strengthen us in the times that we feel the highest of all grief. At the time we feel the worst of all pains. And the time we feel discouraged, He will always be our strength. If we can stand today and decide to ourselves that the Lord is our strength and disregard every fainting feeling we have from the world today, then He will manifest Himself mightily. This is what Prophet Isaiah said in the scripture. Prophesy this unto our lives. We should live with this every day. That the Lord is our strength. Even in our weak times. Let's be the word of the Lord. Thank you, Enno, for sharing your passion for the word with us this morning. 
have such a strong witness uh, to the, the words of Isaiah and what Isaiah was trying to speak to the people who surrounded him, but also it's the message that extends to us today. So we've come through this whole long journey with this book that we've been basing this sermon series on, talking about fear and shame, naming some of the challenges we find in our own lives to taking the risk to be ourselves with one another, to open ourselves up in vulnerability to the ones we love, to the ones with whom we lead, to the ones who are our daily neighbors, and the ones with whom we long to share the gifts of our common life. Today we get to talk about wholeheartedness. Right? <laughs> wholeheartedness is like the dessert when it comes at the end. Because in all of these things, we're talking about fear and shame and all the ways those things manifest as obstacles in our lives. What we're talking about are the things that prevent us from experiencing wholeheartedness. Right? And the things that get in the way. So what is wholeheartedness? Does anybody have a suggestion? We have a small enough group to be conversational about this. What is wholeheartedness? Total submission. Total submission? Okay. Total submission? Anybody else have a possible definition for wholeheartedness? It doesn't have to be completely Being all in. Being all in? Yeah, right. Whole, like putting your whole self in. It sounds like health and wellness. Health and wellness. Mm -hmm. You want to say more about that, Mark? I'm thinking. Okay. <laughs> whole heartedness. Whole healthy. Whole healthy. Whole healthy. Wholeness. Yeah. Everything in balance. Everything in balance. Right. Enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. Right. Completeness. Completeness. Passion. Passion. for your life. I, I'm so glad each of you who spoke up did, because I feel like if we lumped all of those into one melting pot, we'd have pretty close to the complete answer. <laughs> we have all of these elements, right? Zeal, passion, enthusiasm, submission, or being aligned with God's purpose for your life, right? A kind of health, holistic wellness, sense of being all in, <coughs> all one toward a singular purpose. Great, great definitions. Now, one of the things that I found in reading this uh, book from Renee Brown, and the things that she says about wholeheartedness, is she often describes wholeheartedness like from the sign of it, from the outward signs, almost like a backwards definition. Some of the things that she says about wholeheartedness is that it's a way of engaging with the world from a place of worthiness. Right? Accepting that you are worthy and engaging from the world with the world from that place. With that sense of enough comes an embrace of worthiness, boundaries, and engagement. She said that people who were who were wholehearted got very clear on what was important to them and when they could let something go. That sense of being centered on God's purpose for their life, right? And then just mission. <clears throat> it means cultivating the courage, compassion, and connection to wake up in the morning and think, I am enough. I am also brave and worthy of love and belonging. When I read these descriptions and think about all of these pieces that we name as going into wholeheartedness, it aligns very closely with me, with what John Wesley called being an uh, altogether Christian. Right? Not just striving to live in the way of God, wanting to learn about God, but really applying that as a discipline to your whole life. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But we've talked in this space before about Christian perfection, right? Which is the point that we get to, where the temptations and the burdens and the barriers and the hurts of this world 
are so outshined by the presence of God's grace in our life, our conviction that God loves us in particular, that our lives are no longer governed by fear or by shame, right, or by the loud cultural voices that box us into a particular path, but that we are wholly free to experience the richness of life. Now, in the pieces of this that we've talked about so far, we've done a lot of naming and describing. But as I prepared for this week's sermon, I found myself thinking, we've got to have some practical tools. It's one thing to describe what holiness, what wholeheartedness would feel like once you get there. Right? It's one thing to talk about the frame of mind. We want to be switching from a scarcity mentality to a worthiness mentality. To talk about the intellectual side of understanding what's going on within us and what our outlook is. It's another thing altogether to be tasked with the daily work of preparing your heart and soul and life for this transformation. Right? We need some suggestions for how to do this. Or at least I do. It helps me to have some directions. So, I'm not looking for those. There are some practical suggestions in Brene's in Brene Brown's book. Suggestions for countering anxiety with thankfulness. Suggestions for naming when we're feeling vulnerable or in pain. But I also found a lot of practical suggestions in the sermons of John Wesley. And it comes out in a way that's surprisingly simple. I have these on my handout that I didn't have time to copy for our service today. So I'll put it up here. Yeah, I don't know why, but I'll put it up online. The wisdom of Wesleyan tradition and the sermons of John Wesley point to three simple, basic rules for cultivating wholeheartedness. Does anyone here heard of the three simple rules? Ooh, a new audience. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> These are rules for thinking about the actions that you take. The first one, avoid doing harm. Avoid doing harm. The second, do good works. You may have heard a quote from John Wilson, do all the good you can and all the places you can, all the ways you can, means you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. Yeah. Do, do good works. And the third of the three simple rules is attend the ordinances of God. All right, so this is kind of old-fashioned language. Contemporary language has uh, described these, uh, this rule with the words, stay in love with God. But it's not abstract, it's very specific. John Wesley identifies the ordinances of God as the means of grace. Right? The tools that we have for coming into contact with the, the grace of God is already present in our lives. And here's what he names the primary means of grace. Prayer. Alone and with the great congregation. Hearing, reading, and meditating on scripture, and partaking of communion. So we have three simple rules, they're all pretty specific. Right? Avoid doing harm, do good works, and attend on the ordinances of God, prayer, scripture, and communion. And those are basic starting points for beginning to cultivate wholeheartedness in our lives. We're reorienting ourselves toward God's purpose for us, practicing openness to what's going on around us, the way that we're feeling, a kind of mindfulness, so that we know where we are on this walk with God and we have some sense of the direction we're going in. But this is the only the beginning. John Wesley writes several uh, sermons where he talks about these kinds of behaviors, and one of the, his early sermons, the almost Christian, he's pretty harsh about <laughs> these first simple rules. He says, this is just the starting point, right? If you stop here, you're missing out on so much of the wealth 
called the life abundant in Christ. And the next step, for those of us who have already managed to master these things, which he was, our, he was really willing to say that he preached the sermon, very few in the room have. <laughs> there's, another, there's another layer of committing your whole life to Christ, right? to opening your heart to Christ's way and to abs- absorbing that as the mission for your own life. Yet on the basis, Wesley describes a more excellent way in which we intentionally moderate how we sleep, eat, work, play, and spend, remembering that in all things, we are not the givers of our lives and blessings, but the recipients and stewards of what is God's. For example, these next 24 hours of life have been entrusted to you by God. In what way can you please God in living them? In this way, we are practicing constant awareness of our blessings, our ability due to God's power in our lives, and our gratitude to God, raised in praise and prayer. Just as it becomes easier to get up early as one does so more often, we can be stronger and more resilient as we respond to God's grace. Has anybody heard of the um, theater director and theorist, Anton Stanislavski? So he was a Russian um, director. He was what was called an auteur director, where they develop the project as they're working on it and as directing it. Um, a little bit of everything, working with the actors and the directing. And he had this theory that revolutionized the way that actors prepare for their roles. You might have heard um, people identify as method actors. This is where that comes from. Methodists? <laughs> yes! Yes! You, yeah. See, you're like four steps ahead of you. I was thinking, you want to get out of time. Method actors, exactly. And the method that he was suggesting for them is if we want to feel as though we are truly in the presence of this character, right? Not in the presence of an actor who's putting this character on like a mask, but that we are in the presence of someone who has somehow become the character in this drama. And it is the burden of that person to change their life kind of into that person. He believed that you could come to know the character that was set for you to play if you started acting like that person. Right? So if that person was the kind of person who laid around in bed all day and um, who was kind of short with people around, if you started behaving that way, you would come to understand internally many things about that character. Right? And his was very specific kind of methodology. I'm not doing it a great service in the way that I'm describing it now. But his theory is a, is a model for this same kind of theory, right? That Wesley was saying from his observances, but not just from his observances, also from the teachings of Scripture. If we act like the followers of Christ we want to be, if we shape our behavior toward what would make God delight in us, we become that. We become like Christ by behaving like Christ. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if we want to be the kind of person who can spend every hour in a way that brings delight to God, we want to be the kind of person who is kinder, who is gentler, who is more wholehearted. If we, if we fake it, we'll make it. <laughs> I'm getting oversimplification. Many times we want the perks of wholeheartedness. We long for restored joy, for love relationships that deepen in trust and faithfulness, for emotional courage, for integrity, for the freedom to be ourselves, for sanctification, to be made holy by God. But it is hard to take the risks necessary to begin to walk in that way. 
The words from Isaiah are words calling us to hope in God, right? to wait, wait upon God, to trust in God. But if we take the risk, grace is already there to lead us, to lift us up. That even the young, under their own powers, will fall short and grow weary. But those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength, like they have the wings of eagles. I encourage you, if you are seeking wholeheartedness in your own life, to think as we approach the season of Lent, not of something that you will give up this season, but of something that you will add. Some behavior that speaks of the Christian, of the servant, of the follower of Christ you long to be, to adopt it as practice and discipline for this season, to wait upon God by keeping God's ordinances, and to practice cultivating wholeheartedness, knowing that God's grace will be there to guide you, to pick you up, and to bring you to your nevertheless. I hope that as you start to think about that, you'll have more questions than you could possibly entertain in this space. If you do, know that my door, literal or figurative, is always open to conversation about these things, and there's so much more that could have been said in this place than what I'd love to explore that further with you. In this time, I invite your meditation as we sing together for four to go to and contemplate offering our hearts to God.
Thank you, Lord. 